Listening Section Directions This test measures your ability to understand conversations and lectures in English. The listening section is divided into two separate timed parts. You will hear each conversation or lecture only one time. After each conversation or lecture, you will answer some question on it. The questions typically ask about the main idea and supporting details. Some questions ask about a speaker's purpose or attitude. Answer the questions based on what is stated or implied by the speakers. You may take notes while you listen. You may use your notes to help you answer the questions. Notes will not be scored. In some questions, you will see this icon. This means that you will hear, but not see. Part of the question. Some of the questions have special directions. These directions appear in a gray box on the screen. Most questions are worth one point. If question is worth more than one point, it will have special directions that indicate how many points you can receive. You must answer each question. After you answer, click on Next, then click on OK to confirm your answer and go on to the next question. After you click on OK, you cannot return to previous questions. In an actual test or during this practice test, a clock at the top of the screen will show you how much time is remaining. The clock will not count down while you are listening. The clock will count down only while you are answering questions. Click on Continue at any time to dismiss these directions. Listen to a conversation between a student and a university administrator. Hi, I'm Namita. I had an appointment with you. Ah, uh, yes. I remember. You're here to discuss your graduation requirements, correct? Yes, that's right. I've completed all my courses, and I'm ready to graduate. Excellent. Congratulations on reaching this milestone. The purpose of this meeting is to go over the administrative checklist before finalizing your graduation. I see. So, what exactly does the checklist entail? It's a routine process to ensure that all your university-related matters are in order. We need to make sure there are no outstanding fees or unresolved issues. I don't think I have any outstanding fees, but I did have a question about my student loans. Am I supposed to start repaying them immediately after graduation? No, you don't have to worry about loan repayment just yet. You will have a grace period before you need to start making payments. Focus on securing a job first. Good luck with your job search. Thank you. That's a relief. Now, about the checklist, is there anything else I need to address? Well, there seems to be a fine on your record for an overdue book from the library. It's a book titled The History of Modern Art. Oh, I remember borrowing that book for a research project. I returned it on time, though. I'm not sure why there's a fine. Let me check the details. Ah, it seems there was a mix-up in the library records. They marked the book as overdue even though you returned it. I apologize for the confusion. That's all right. So, what should I do now? I'll make a note of the error and inform the library. They will rectify the situation and remove the fine from your record. You don't need to worry about it anymore. Remember, these things happen, and we're here to assist you. Once the issue with the library fine is resolved, you can come back here to collect your graduation paperwork. I will do that. Thanks for your assistance. I'll make sure to follow up with the library and collect my paperwork once everything is sorted out. What is the conversation mainly about? What issue is the student facing?
What does the man imply on library overdue? Why didn't the student get the library notice? Why does the man say this? Ah, it seems there was a mix-up in the library records. Listen to part of a lecture in an oceanography class. All right, class. Today we're diving deep, figuratively speaking of course, to explore hydrothermal vents. These fascinating features on the ocean floor play a significant role in both the geology and ecology of our planet. But before we delve into the unique life forms that thrive around vents, let's understand how these vents form. What do you think is needed for a hydrothermal vent to form? Hmm. Maybe hot water and some kind of opening on the ocean floor? Hydrothermal vents are essentially underwater geysers, and for them to exist, we need two key ingredients, heat and fissures in the ocean floor. These vents typically occur in clusters, sometimes with dozens clustered together in a single field. Now, where does this intense heat come from deep beneath the ocean? The answer lies in the Earth's internal furnace, magma chambers. These chambers of molten rock reside just a few kilometers below the ocean floor, radiating immense heat. The surrounding rock gets scorching hot, reaching temperatures as high as 500 degrees Celsius. That's incredibly hot. But what happens to the ocean water that interacts with this scorching rock? The ocean floor, even at these depths, is constantly bathed in frigid water. Typically around 2 degrees Celsius, this cold seawater seeps down through cracks in the Earth's crust, encountering the superheated rock. Imagine it like pouring cold water on a hot stovetop. The water heats up rapidly. Now, the key thing to remember is that the immense pressure of the deep ocean allows water to remain liquid even at these extreme temperatures. So, in a hydrothermal field, the water can reach a staggering 300 to 400 degrees Celsius. That's hot enough to boil an egg in seconds. And as this superheated water rises, it carries a valuable cargo, dissolved minerals leached from the surrounding rock. These include iron, copper, and other metals. But the journey isn't over yet. When the water reaches the ocean floor again, it encounters the much colder surrounding water. This rapid temperature change has a dramatic effect. The dissolved minerals can no longer stay in solution and precipitate out. This precipitation creates a spectacular display. These vents often have a plume that resembles smoke billowing out of the Earth's crust. But the color of the plume can be a clue to the temperature of the vent. So, are there different types of hydrothermal vents based on the color of the plume? Black smokers are the most common type of vent, and as the name suggests, they emit a plume that looks like black smoke. This black color is due to the precipitation of sulfur and iron-rich minerals as the hot water cools. However, white smokers also exist. These vents emit a plume that appears white because the water temperature is cooler. 
typically between 100 to 300 degrees Celsius. While still incredibly hot, this cooler water doesn't dissolve as much sulfur or iron. Instead, it precipitates minerals like silica, which gives the plume its characteristic white color. Both black and white smokers contribute to the formation of unique chimney structures. As the mineral-rich water is expelled, these minerals precipitate out and build up around the vent opening, layer upon layer, over time. These deposits can grow into massive chimney-like structures, reaching tens of meters in height. These chimneys are a testament to the constant flow of superheated water and dissolved minerals. So, next time you hear about hydrothermal vents, remember, they're not just fascinating geological formations. They play a crucial role in shaping the ocean's chemistry and providing the foundation for a unique and thriving ecosystem that thrives in the darkness of the deep sea. What is the lecture mainly about? What's the key contrast between geysers and hydrothermal vents? What part of hydrothermal vents matters most to the professor? What factors lead to the formation of hydrothermal vents? Choose two answers. What sets black smokers apart from white smokers? Why does the professor say this? This can lead to a misleading perception of evolution as being directed towards larger sizes, while in reality, it is a random process. Listen to part of a lecture in an art class. All right, everyone, today we're going to delve into the importance of personal expression in art and how it connects with the world around us. Before we begin, let me emphasize the significance of eliciting a response from your viewers. After all, art is a means of communication, and the goal is to make your audience feel and think. 
Now, what exactly triggers a response in a work of art? It's often the artist's expression of something deeply personal. When you genuinely care about a place or an idea, you have the power to make others care about it too. Your art should communicate a concept or a feeling, allowing your own experiences to come to the forefront. Let's take an example. Imagine I drew a picture of my son, who is five years old, observing a horse. In that artwork, I intended to capture not only my son's reaction, but also the horse's response. I wanted to convey their mutual discomfort, that uncertain moment where they pondered whether to run, fight, or become friends. When this drawing was exhibited in galleries, it evoked a range of comments from viewers. It truly spoke to them on a deeper level. Therefore, a strong work of art provokes a strong viewer response. To create such powerful artwork, you must expand your powers of observation and truly absorb your surroundings. However, it's crucial to go beyond mere observation. You need to be emotionally involved, just like a strong artist would be. Strong artists look at their surroundings and find something personal within them. Even in the most ordinary environment, there is something special, something intriguing waiting to be discovered. It's easy to dismiss the familiar as mundane, but if you pay close attention, you'll uncover unique aspects that deserve artistic expression. Now, expressing your own views and perspectives plays a pivotal role in becoming a strong artist. It's important to know yourself and embrace your identity. Failing to understand yourself can lead to misconceptions about your art. Viewers may struggle to differentiate between what reflects your own experiences and ideas and what reflects the influences of others. A common challenge students face in this course is the tendency to rely on popular styles or imitate the work of famous artists, including my own style as the teacher. However, I urge you to resist this temptation. Instead, invest time in exploring and understanding your own worldview. As you gain a deeper understanding of yourself, your personal artistic style will naturally emerge. I'm not suggesting that you should disregard learning from other artists or improving your technical skills through classes. Both are valuable pursuits. However, if you truly want your art to communicate something meaningful, you must first understand yourself and how you respond to the world around you. But enough lecturing from me. I'm sure you've already noticed my passion for what it takes to be an artist. Now, let's discuss today's assignment. I have an exercise that will help you become more aware of your surroundings, and this is where the cameras come into play. Photographs are an excellent tool for generating ideas for your drawings. Using your cameras, capture images of your surroundings, people, objects, or scenes that resonate with you. Then, as you review these photos, look for the elements that triggered your personal feelings when you took the picture. These features can serve as inspiration for your drawings, allowing you to reflect your unique artistic vision. Remember, this exercise isn't about copying those elements exactly. Instead, I encourage you to interpret and draw them in your style, whether it's abstract or realistic. The goal is to convey your perspective on the world around you. So, grab your cameras, and let's embark on this creative journey together. What is the lecture mainly about? Why did the professor mention a sketch of his son? What's the professor's point about artists when he mentions tourists?
What does the professor urge his students to do to improve as artists? Why does the professor suggest using cameras for a class activity? What does the professor mean when he says this? Remember, this exercise isn't about copying those elements exactly. Listen to a conversation between a student and a professor. Professor, I just received my paper back from you. Is there something wrong with it? Actually, your paper is very well written. However, there is a major problem that we need to address. I see. What is the problem? The novel you focused on, Wide Sargasso Sea, is based on another novel called Jane Eyre. Why didn't you discuss Jane Eyre in your paper? Well, I haven't read Jane Eyre, but I believe Wide Sargasso Sea can stand on its own. I agree that Wide Sargasso Sea is a wonderful book by Jean Rhys, but if you are writing an academic paper, it's essential to acknowledge the influence of Jane Eyre. I'm not entirely convinced. Aren't all books influenced by other books? It's challenging to draw a definitive line. In this case, it's not just about subtle influences. Jean Rhys directly based her book on Jane Eyre, which is a widely recognized and influential novel. But Jean Rhys didn't merely rewrite Jane Eyre, did she? If you had read Jane Eyre, you would know that Reese reinvented it by writing from the perspective of a secondary character, Antoinette. In Jane Eyre, Antoinette is a minor character. Would Reese have written Wide Sargasso Sea if Jane Eyre didn't exist? I'm not sure. I noticed many parallels between Antoinette and Jean Reese herself. They both have West Indian origins and later moved to England. Perhaps Reese would have written a similar book regardless. Then why didn't Reese base Antoinette solely on her own life? Why did she use a character created by someone else? Additionally, isn't the setting significant? Jane Eyre takes place in England, while Wide Sargasso Sea is primarily set in Jamaica. I understand your point now. I wish I had discussed this with you before starting my paper. I worked hard, and my schedule is tight. I schedule conferences for a reason. Your paper is good and thoughtful. You make original points. I believe if you read Jane Eyre, you could write something exceptional. At least consider it. I appreciate your advice, Professor. However, reading another book and rewriting the paper seems daunting. I'm not sure if I have any creativity left. I understand your concerns, but I believe you can produce something truly remarkable. Take some time to think it over. What are the speakers mainly discussing? What's the student's first response to the professor's critique?
What key aspect about the main character Antoinette did the professor feel was overlooked in the wide Sargasso Sea? Why does the professor mention the setting in the wide Sargasso Sea? What does the man suggest about revising his paper? Listen to part of a lecture in an ecology class. We've discussed how an animal's visual perception can greatly influence its behavior. Today, I want to explore another fascinating example of this phenomenon by focusing on the fiddler crab. But before we delve into that, can anyone remind us of some differences in animal visual perception? Yes, Sarah. Well, last time we talked about insects with compound eyes, where each eye sees multiple images of an object. Excellent point, Sarah. Now, let's shift our attention to the fiddler crab, which also possesses compound eyes. The fiddler crab has been extensively studied due to its correlation between perception and behavior. It is an easily observable creature, residing in mudflats and having a confined territory with minimal movement. When you look at the fiddler crab, you'll notice that its eyes are situated on stalks that extend vertically. This unique positioning provides the crab with a panoramic visual field. Let me demonstrate. As you can see, the fiddler crab has a 360-degree field of vision. The tip of each eye stalk consists of thousands of tiny eyes, similar to compound vision in certain insects. An intriguing aspect is that the crab's visual acuity is highest at the periphery of its visual field. This makes sense when you consider that the edges of its vision are where other crabs, potential rivals or mates, are likely to be found. However, even the sharpest part of the crab's visual field isn't particularly clear. It's comparable to looking at a newspaper and seeing a blurry white object with a few black spots. Are you following so far? Now, let's turn our attention to another critical aspect of visual perception for animals' predator detection. For fiddler crabs, their primary predators are often birds. And interestingly, the central focus of the crab's vision is the sky. Surprisingly, the center of the crab's visual field is even blurrier than the edges. But that seems counterintuitive. If the center of their vision is so blurry, how can they defend themselves? Couldn't they mistake anything in the air for a bird? Excellent question, Mary. We must remember to view this from the crab's perspective rather than our own. Due to the overall blurriness, the fiddler crab's worldview is quite simple. It assumes that everything in the sky is a potential predator, while everything on the ground is a fellow crab. This basic distinction is crucial for its survival. Thus, what may be a disadvantage to us, blurry vision actually aids the crab in simplifying its response to visual stimuli. But how can we be certain about this? Researchers have conducted experiments to validate this hypothesis. For instance, they placed a cylinder on a mudflat inhabited by fiddler crabs. The crabs interacted with the object as if it were another crab fighting it, ignoring it, or even considering it as a potential mate. However, when the same cylinder was thrown into the air above the mud flats, all the crabs immediately sought refuge in their burrows. 
This demonstrates how the crab's behavior is influenced by its vision. An object on the ground, regardless of its identity, is perceived as another crab when it falls within the peripheral visual field. However, the same object seen in the air, at the center of their vision, is perceived as non-crab-like and potentially dangerous. This example underscores the profound impact of visual perception on an animal's behavior. It reminds us that when studying animal behavior, we must consider their unique sensory perspectives rather than imposing our own biases. Understanding the interplay between perception and behavior in different species allows us to gain deeper insights into the diversity of life on Earth and appreciate the remarkable adaptations that have evolved over time. What is the lecture mainly about? What similarity does the professor point out between an insect and a fiddler crab? What characteristic of the fiddler crab did the professor mention as easily observable? What's the key differentiation that the professor emphasizes a fiddler crab must make? What would a fiddler crab do if a ball was thrown into the sky above it? Listen again to part of the lecture. Then answer the question. For fiddler crabs, their primary predators are often birds, and interestingly, the central focus of the crab's vision is the sky. What does the professor mean when he says this? Interestingly, the central focus of the crab's vision is the sky.